Okay. Um, t- today's going to be extremely interesting. I-, I-, I have an incredibly fascinating guest. Um, someone I've read about, someone who I have actually watched uh, a good portion of his life story um, on television, as I'm sure many of you have, not realizing that he is the guy behind it. Um, I just want to read your credentials, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, first and foremost, I want to welcome you, Hector Boreas, former DEA special agent with over 30 years experience in counterterrorism and narcotics. Um, You're credited for solving the kidnap, torture, and murder of undercover DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarea by Mexican drug lord Felix Gallardo of the Guadalajara uh, cartel. You are also an author of the book The Last Narc, um, of which I briefly spoke about. The, the, The Last Narc, we have all seen it on Amazon TV um, you, 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 part of your story was chronicled in, um, Narcos on Netflix, um, Narcos Mexico. You're a producer. And like I said, a former DEA agent, Hector, please welcome to Vlad TV. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, even as I go down your list of credentials, yeah, Hector, I was talking to you offline. Damn, you have lived one hell of a life, buddy. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to getting into this story. Um, do you mind if I take it back to the beginning? No, go ahead. Right ahead. We can start from the very beginning. Okay. Looking at you, you look Mexican. Um, it, were you born in Mexico? No, I was born in the United States. But you are of Mexican heritage. Um, yes, Mexican parents, Mexican heritage, yes. Okay, what part of the United States were you born in? I was born in Tucson, Arizona, where I went to high school and um, university there. Okay, um, in in terms of Tucson, is is there a barrio out there? Were you were you born in in a specific part? Yes, I was born in the in the South Tucson area there. A lot of uh, Mexican American and Hispanic families there. Uh, we did have some uh, Anglos that lived in the area, so uh, I grew up speaking Spanglish, half English, half Spanish. You know, uh, so my Spanish growing up wasn't the the pure Castilian or the pure Mexican uh, Spanish that is spoken in Mexico. Uh, I grew up like speaking like uh, park el carro, uh, parquear el carro, which is not there is there's no word as parquear in Spanish. It means park. So it was Spanglish that we as kids invented to communicate with our non-speaking Anglo friends. Understood. You said you went to school out there at the at the university. What did you major in? University of Arizona. I majored in um, business business administration. Okay. Um, I know you went um, into the service. How did you end up in the service and why not go directly into the workforce, uh, especially majoring in business? Basically, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old, I attended the University of Arizona. I, as I stated before, I majored in business. Later in life, I got a degree in business administration. Uh, while there, um, I met some very interesting people like uh, Linda Cordova, uh, now known as uh, uh, Miss, uh, Miss America. Um, Wonder Woman, Linda Carter. Uh, I knew her as, like I said, uh, her last name was Cordova at the time. I met uh, Linda Ronstadt, who became a major singer. As a matter of fact, I played in a rock and roll band and competed against her band when I was at the U of A. Uh, I also met Gerardo Rivera there. So we were all alumni at the University of Arizona at the same time. You got to be kidding me. Wow. You literally went to school with the original Wonder Woman. That's right. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Incredible. Okay. Uh, how'd you end up in the service? Well, I was in my uh, second year at the University of Arizona, and they cut my 2S deferment because they needed bodies for Vietnam, and uh, my deferment was canceled in, in uh, that summer in August. Of 1967, I was inducted into the uh, U.S. Army. That simple. I was just one day got a letter saying report to the induction center, and I did. And when I got there, they uh, 
I never went home. They 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 put me on a bus to uh, uh, basic training at Fort Bliss, Texas. That's how I ended Got up you. in the army. Okay, we're talking 68, 69? Right. Okay, Vietnam is going on at that time. Did, did you get deployed to Vietnam? Well, yes, I was appointed to actually, uh, I, was, I, I was trained as a 91B20, which was my uh, MOS military occupational specialty, uh, combat medic. So luckily for me, I was assigned to a, a, a unit that was bringing uh, the wounded and dead out of Vietnam into Korea and, 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 uh, and Japan. Okay, how long were you in the service? Two years. Okay. So while in uh, the service, did you see active combat? No, as a matter of fact, I did not. I, like I said, I was very lucky that I was assigned to the medical battalion, which uh, was just in charge of uh, transporting, like I said, uh, the people that were shut up and that needed uh, the amputations and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and, and also, we, we also carried a lot of the dead out of there. Uh, we, we yeah, I can imagine. A medical evacuation battalion is what it was. Okay, so so even as a medic, I, I got to believe you saw more death than you'd like to even remember at this point. Very, very scary, yes. And I also, while I was there, um, got to escort two of my friends uh, that, were, that were killed in the Vietnam War, transported their bodies back to Tucson, Arizona for military burial. Wow. Um, before we even go forward, um, th thank you for your service. We, we, and I speak on behalf of, of everybody here. We appreciate um, your service. Thank you. Sir. When you came home from the service, what'd you end up doing? When I got home, uh, my dad has broken his back. He was a, a bricklayer, and uh, my family was uh, in, in need of, uh, of uh, economic help. So instead of uh, uh, enrolling at the University of Arizona, going back to school right away, which I could have because I had the GI Bill, I decided that I would uh, get a job. And I looked for jobs, and the only openings that I saw in the newspaper was uh, jobs for police officers. So I decided, well, maybe I'll take a job as a cop and work there for a couple to three years and then go back to school. But luckily, when I applied for the, for the, for the police department there, they had a, uh, a, a program where people that wanted to continue their education could while working, you know, midnight and, 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 uh, and different shifts. So um, I was able to go back to school and uh, became a, 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 a policeman there in Tucson. I hadn't planned to be a cop, but as 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 most people that join departments, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. it. It it really it really got into into my into my bones. Uh, I remember uh, right out of the academy, uh, while out on patrol by myself, I got a call that a a, a man had broken into a house, and uh, the the lady was in need of help. There was a lady alone at the house. So I was like two blocks away, so I proceeded from there. And when I got there, I ran in and I saw the suspect run out the back door. I chased him and I arrested him. And it felt so good. It felt so good to be able to protect this old lady that was really, really fear, in fear of her life from this guy. And uh, like I said, it got, into, it, got in, it got into my soul. And I decided, you know what? I'm gonna stay in law enforcement. So I continued my education, and and after working as a policeman there, later I went to work as the uh, as a state officer with Arizona Department of Public Safety, where I was a highway patrolman writing tickets. And because I spoke Spanish, Sean, they, they would take me out of uniform and, and send me to go buy undercover to go buy heroin and different drugs. One day I was writing tickets, the next day I was undercover buying heroin, and uh, I came to the attention of uh, the, the, the DEA supervisor down there. And he actually recruited and brought me into the DEA. Okay. At this, because I'm listening to your story, and it, it almost feels like a couple of things were happening. Number one, you found your calling. When you ran and, and, and arrested that guy who was, um, trying to rob that old lady, you th there was a sense of goodness. You felt like, you know, I love this. But number two, it almost feels like you had a knack for this thing. Do, do, do you feel like 
okay, I know I went to school for for business, but protecting and serving, th this is really where I belong. You know, you're right. I, it was a calling for me because I was a natural undercover um, person. Um, I looked like a crook. Um, I, I, I spoke like a crook because I grew up in the barrio talking to all the, the little gangsters there and stuff, and I used to get in fights with them, so on and so forth. So I grew up being a kind of like a tough guy because my dad made me like that. When I was 10 years old, my dad enrolled me into a boxing team because he wanted me to be tough. He, I was the oldest of uh, six brothers, and he said, you're going to have to protect your little brother, so you, I, I'm going to take you to the gym. My dad had boxed when he was young. I'm going to show you how to fight so you can protect uh, your, your, your younger brothers. So therefore, I grew up with, with, with the bad guys, and I used to get along with them. So I was a natural, and I spoke Spanish, and, you know, and I got along with all the, all the little hoodies, all the little ho hoods there in the neighborhood when I was going to high school and stuff. So when I went to go and work undercover, I felt at home with the crooks. You know, I kind of, mm. in fact, I like some of the guys they arrested. <laughs> you know, that's interesting because obviously you come from the same neighborhood that many of the crooks come from. That's right. Uh, so you naturally know how they think and you understand that at the core of it, many of them, they're people just like you and I. They just happen to end up on the wrong side of the tracks. Um, Is it normal for for undercovers working for state police to get recruited by DEA? No, uh, it, it wasn't really. It's just that I wasn't even assigned to the drug unit. Like I said, I was assigned to work uh, as a regular highway patrolman writing tickets and investigating car accidents. But because the drug unit didn't have a Spanish speaker back then, they were all basically Anglo guys. Uh, they would bring in minorities, me, because I spoke Spanish, and, 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 and black officers to work undercover for them because, you know, obviously uh, Mexicans do not trust the Anglos, so they're not going to, you know, accept them and sell them drugs. And, of course, in the black communities, I have a lot of black DEA uh, friends that, that are also very good undercover agents. You know, you go into South Central and stuff, and, and 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 you're not you're not black you're you're the police man you know so they used Correct. us they used us as minorities we were the undercover agents for the U.S. drug enforcement you know they did especially the Colombians I mean they didn't trust the, you know some Anglo looking guy and they were they were going to sell him anything but I, I walk in looking like this long hair boots my cowboy hat my jeans and I start talking their lingo and next thing you know they're offering me drugs. Mm. While at the DEA, I read this is the first time you killed a man. C can we go through that? Absolutely. Well, the first time I killed a man was not in the States. I was a, I was stationed in Mexico. And uh, while, while working undercover down there, they brought an informant uh, that, that knew some people that, uh, that, that had opium up in the mountains. And they also had uh, like uh, five tons of marijuana that they wanted to sell, and I'm talking uh, being out of out of uh, working out of uh, out of Guadalajara in Jalisco. So they sent me with the informant to go meet the crooks and negotiate buying opium. It wasn't even heroin; it was bottles of opium. And uh, they couldn't provide surveillance for me because we're up in the we're up in the jungle, we're up in the mountains. They couldn't really surveil me, so I went on my own. And I remember walking because it wasn't even paved roads. We, we, we walked up trails and, and remember coming to a river. And, and I was asking the informant, I said, when are we going to get there, man? We've been walking for three hours already. He said, oh, once we cross the river, we're going to be close to where we're going to meet the people. Uh, to make a long story short, um, we ended up uh, crossing the river. I ruined my shoes and everything, I remember. And uh, it started getting dark and he started making signals with a flashlight. And I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm giving them signals because if we just walk up there, they're going to shoot us. I said, oh, okay. So then I saw them signaling back. And we got get up there, and there's an encampment there. And there's men and women, and women were making tortillas and stuff. And and I'm introduced as a, as a, as a buyer. And the people there, every, everybody was carrying AK-47s, really armed to the teeth. And they started showing me the opiums, which was wrapped in, in white sheets. And they showed me the marijuana. And I said, okay, sounds good, sounds good. This is, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll buy it all. And uh, they said, okay. So uh, 
uh, how are we going to deliver it to you? And I said, well, obviously, I can't come up here and get it. You're going to have to bring it down by the river where we can, you know, put it in trucks. And it's, well, sounds good. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. He said, we'll bring it down to you. And I said, okay. So I walked back and Jesus, I, I didn't get back to, 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 the, to, the, uh, to my other DEA agents until about 3, 4 in the afternoon. And I, they asked me what's happening. And I said, hey, they agreed to bring the, 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 the stuff down. They're going to bring all the, all, all the, all the opium and, and the marijuana down. And uh, when they come down, I said, I'll meet them there and then I'll give a bus signal and we'll take him down. That's simple. Does he really think they're going to bring the stuff down? And I said, they told me they would. I said, why should I not believe them? So they said, okay. So uh, they did. They, they, they came down with the stuff. And, of course, we had soldiers and people all around uh, in the area there where we were going to receive the stuff. I had trucks, supposedly, that I was going to load the opium, the marijuana into. But in the trucks, we had hidden soldiers. They were hidden in the trucks, waiting for me to give the bus signal. They were going to jump out and, of course, arrest everybody and seize the drugs. So what we didn't know is that they had put their own people in that area where they were going to deliver, uh, basically, to protect to pro to protect uh, their their drugs, so they when they came down, and they they said well, okay we're ready. He said you got the money, and I said yeah we're ready to go. I give the bus signal, and man all hell broke loose. Everybody started shooting, and um, we ended up killing seven people there. I ended up I don't know I I can't tell you I I, I don't know um, who I killed or how many I killed or everybody was just shooting. We were all shooting with automatic weapons. The firefight didn't last very long. It probably lasted about maybe five, five minutes. And, uh, luckily, uh, we didn't lose anybody. We, but we, we ended up killing seven other traffickers. That was the first time that I encountered, you know, a major shootout where there were dead people. Wow. Okay. Um, Whoa, it's a couple of things I want to go over. How, how much drugs were you buying at that time? I don't remember. It was like a couple of tons of marijuana, and it was about uh, but then 10, 10 kilos of opium. It wasn't processed heroin yet. It was just the black balls of opium. Okay, do you remember how much you were supposed to buy it for? I think it was a, a couple of million dollars that I was supposed to have. Of course, I didn't even have the money. They, they just trusted me. They trusted the informant, actually, the guy that set him up. And that's where I was going with this. You know, you're coming up there. They don't know you. you you're there on the strength of the informant. And you say, I want to buy all the drugs. That didn't tip them off that, hey, we need to watch this guy close. Like he he might be working for the other side. Evidently, they trusted him. And then they checked me out. And, of course, they, they wanted to see my identification. And I told them I'm American and I had a false ID from California, you know, California driver's license and all of that. So I showed him all my ID. And I said, uh, here's who I am. Either you trust me or you don't. I said, I don't care if I don't buy it from you. I'll buy it from somebody else. You know, one of the things that really worked for me, Sean, when I was undercover is I never acted too like I was, you know, pushing him. I always said, yeah, if you want to sell it to me, fine. And if you, you feel uncomfortable with me, with me and you don't like me, well, that's fine. I'll, I'll buy it from somebody else. Well, I'm not here to pressure you guys or you guys want to do it, let's do it. And if you guys don't want to do it, that's fine. Maybe we'll may remain friends and we'll do another one deal sometime down down the road, you know? Never, never pressure anybody. And they like that. Got you. After that incident, was your cover blown? Uh, in that area, remember, I worked all over Mexico. So in that, in that little area, yeah. And, and and not really. I don't think too bad because most of the people that that we ended up uh, trying to arrest ended up dead. So I think we only arrested two of them. The other everybody else was shot dead. How, and you also said um, you had some agents waiting, and they were supposed to take these guys down. How many agents did you have with you? A DEA agents. I think we only had a couple. It was mainly Mexican federal police agents and soldiers that we were that we were using. How many in total would you say? I would say that we probably had about 15, 20 soldiers and maybe 10 uh, Mexican federal judicial police officers. Okay. Um, and the drug dealers, how many would you say they had hiding in the bushes? I don't know because they obviously, well, after they opened up, they a lot of them ran, you know, and you're, you're talking about almost a jungle area where it's very, very, very dense, uh, you know, shrubbery and stuff. So you just see the, the, the smoke coming out of, out of behind the bushes and trees and you just fire back. 
So I can't tell you who killed who or what happened. Everybody just just started opening up with automatic weapons. Understood. Okay. Um, I know you said you worked all over Mexico, but you also worked at that time in Colombia, correct? Correct. Uh, from what years to what years were you in Colombia? Uh, in and out. See, I was never, I was never like a like a guy stationed in Colombia. When you're an undercover operator for the DEA, you come and go. So I was in and out of a country back and before es Escobar was killed. You're talking uh, 89, 90. You know when when it, when when Pablo Escobar was 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 a king of of a Medellin cartel. So I was in and out of those countries for the couple two or three years. Okay, did you ever have any dealings with um, Pablo Escobar himself? You know, you don't, you can't get close to those guys. Uh, any DEA agent that'll tell you that he met Pablo Escobar in person is not telling you the truth. Those guys are so insulated and so well protected. And remember, they have police working for them and military guys that protect them. You can't you you can you can get into their into the network and find out what's going on undercover, but to meet the main guys is, is it's almost impossible to tell you the truth. Got you. Okay, we've all seen the um, the Netflix series Narcos. Um, there were two agents. Uh, I believe they were FBI. Um, Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. I know both of them. They were DEA agents. They were DEA as well? Yes, they are. They're, they're, they're DEA retired agents, yes. Okay, did, did, when, you were, when you were stationed out there, did, did you have a chance to work with both of them? No, because the way we worked undercover is I never met most of the agents because I wasn't allowed to go to the office. When you go undercover, you go to wherever they, they assigned you to, to, to go work out of, and, and you don't go to the embassy, obviously, because you don't want to show yourself. So all my communication when I was undercover in Colombia would be uh, via phone to the, to, 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 to the office. But show up at the office to meet the guys, like, no. Uh, I met some of the agents, but I didn't meet, I remember meeting them specifically. They would come out and meet me at different places to keep up, uh, pick up drugs or pick up uh, or give me money or do different things. But um, they weren't involved with me because I, I, I couldn't be seen with them because they were known and I couldn't go to the office. Got you. You know, uh, and this is just a random question. I mean, you guys are working. It, it, this is a high stakes game you're playing. Um I, I got to believe you, you live in, in foreign countries. You got your family with you, correct? No, you don't. No? No. Not when you're undercover, no. When you're assigned to an embassy, yeah, you take your family, but you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're assigned to work out of an embassy, then you do. But when you're working like I was, uh, my family stayed back here. I was going, flying in and out, doing the undercover work. How, how often are you getting back home to even see your family at that point? Sometimes it all depends on the operation. Uh, sometimes you would be gone three or four months. You know, sometimes just a couple of weeks. You know, it it it, it all it, it all differed. Okay, you know, I ask you this because being undercover, it it has to be extremely extremely scary. You're living a lie twenty four hours a day. How, how does somebody like you? deal with nerves, uh, deal with your own fears, because you don't know, you know, you have informants that can turn on you. You have people that are working in the government that are, that are also on the payroll for some of these different uh, cartels and groups. Is there ever a moment's peace for somebody like you? Uh, well, you actually become a, what's called an adrenaline junkie. I was definitely an adrenaline junkie. I, I love to, to live on the edge. Uh, it's kind of like being a fighter pilot. You know, you, you enjoy that, that rush. Uh, so I kind of enjoyed it. Yes, it was very dangerous. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to survive retirement. I thought I was going to get killed because I was in and out so much. Uh, I knew that I was very good. And when I learned how good I was at my trade at, at, at working undercover was when I had to go undercover into a captain of, of, um, of sheriff's department that was bringing in heroin. And uh, when I convinced a captain that I was a crook and he sold me heroin and I arrested him and another narcotics agent took the boot, then I knew I was very good. 
wow, wow, damn. You would have to be an adrenaline junkie and you would have to feel like I am great at doing what I'm doing because you can trust nobody. I mean, you just said you arrested a captain. I, you know, me outside looking in, I would feel I wouldn't feel safe sitting with anybody unless uh, this is somebody that that I have literally been partners with for years. And I know that this person is incorruptible. He, he is in this fight with me to the death. You know, when you're working undercover, you're carrying your life in your hand. Uh, this guy was a a, uh, a captain in the Webb County Narcotics Sheriff's Department in Laredo, Texas. He, he, he had like 20 uh, narcotic agents working under his command. The first time that he sold me heroin, Sean, which was a sample of kilos of heroin, he sold me the heroin at the sheriff's department. Uh, he picked me up at, at the airport in San Antonio, drove me down to Laredo, and he said, I've got your, your, your samples of heroin. It's 10 ounces. Did you bring the money? And I said, yes, I'll, I'll deliver it. I'll deliver it to you when we get to Laredo. We get to Laredo, and he, he drives me right into the sheriff's department. And he's introducing me to the other narcotic agents there, as his cousin uh, Manny from Chicago, and uh, so, and I'm wondering why did he bring me to the sheriff's department? So he he as we're walking into his private office because he had his own private office. He was a captain there. We 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 there's two long haired guys there, two Anglo guys with long haired little hippie looking guys, and he says Manny because I was using the the name Manny undercover. He said, "You see those two guys right there?" And I said, "Yeah, what about them?" He said, those guys are DEA agents. And I looked at him and he said, really? Those guys are DEA agents? He says, yep. I said, they look like pretty dirty to me. I said, why don't you ask them to take a shower, man? They look like they haven't showered in weeks. <laughs> and we kind of laughed and we went inside his office. And he gets behind his desk and he pulls out a um, shaving kit. And he throws it at me. So I open it and, and I see there's 10 ounces of heroin in there. And he says, there, there's your stuff, that's your sample of what you're going to be getting. And I said, great. Do you bring my money? And I said, yeah. I added it in an, in an envelope in my coat pocket, and I handed him the envelope. Didn't even comment, Sean. He just grabbed it and put it in the middle of his door. He says, let's go party, Manny. And we did. We went out and partied all night. Oh, you, the, you know what the craziest part is? As you were telling me this story, I'm thinking this is happening in a foreign country. Did I get this right that this happened in Texas? Laredo, Texas, to be exact. You got to be kidding me. Yes, I'm not. Did this, did this become national news? Uh, well, no, not really. It made news locally there. I mean, uh, in fact, he was running for sheriff when I arrested him. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, put him wow. in, I locked him up in his own jail. Are you serious? I'm serious. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, let's bring this thing back around. So obviously you're great at your job. And I'm sure um, after that bus, your name is rising through the ranks. Um, I, I, I want to segue, if, if you will, um, Kiki Camarena. 1980, he gets stationed out in Guadalajara, Mexico. D did you know him before? He went to Guadalajara, or did you meet him while working in Mexico? I met him before he went to Mexico. Uh, I, I knew him when he was stationed in uh, Fresno, California. His assignment before he was uh, shipped to uh, Guadalajara. Uh, what type of man was he? He was a, a very good, he was like me, a, very, a great undercover operative, a uh, big, strong guy. He wasn't a little guy, uh, kind of muscular. Spoke very good English and Spanish. Wrote very good reports. Had a, a lot of a lot of very effective informants. As a matter of fact, when he was picked up, I was using two of his informants on a, on a wiretap operation out of uh, Indio, California. So I had been talking to Kiki right before he got picked up. Mm, and and by picked up, you mean kidnapped? Kidnapped, exactly. Okay. Um. Wow. 
Let, let's go into this Kiki Camarena story because you're credited um, for for really solving that crime, if you will. So take me kind of to the beginning. Why was Kiki Camarena picked up to begin with? There are several stories that the government puts out, but here I'm going to tell you the truth. It's undisputable. Nobody can, can dispute the real truth. Before the Camarena case, I was a shooting star. I thought that uh, I was going to at least retire um, a, a deputy or something from the DEA. I was I was very well uh, recognized and awarded. Uh, I was working in uh, out of Mexico. They kidnapped Kiki in '85, and un until 1990, they really had not solved the case. They knew that the Guadalajara cartel members had uh, kidnapped Kiki. They also knew the involvement of the DFS, which is the Directorate of Federal Security, which is RCIA, okay? We knew that elements of, of, of the DFS and the cartel members, along with other crooked cops, had kidnapped Kiki, all right? But they never could get eyewitnesses. I mean, people that were there, they could walk us through the crime. So they pulled me out of Mexico, and I, and I talked directly to the director of DEA, and he said, Hector, he says, you know Mexico. That's why we're bringing you in. Can you get us a witness that, can, that was there that can tell us who, why they picked him up, who interrogated him? We really want to know how he died. We want to know all the details of his murder. Can you do that for me? And I said, I believe I can. However, I'm going to need a big informant budget, and I'm going to need the cooperation of INS. He says, what do you mean? What do we need INS for? Immigration and, service. And, and, and for the record, what is INS? Uh, the uh, Immigration Service. Immigration, okay. and, immigration and natural uh, naturalization service, INS. So he says, why do we need the INS? And I said, because if I'm going to bring any witnesses to, to Kiki's murder, we're going to have to bring their whole family into the United States because the first time that we bring a witness and he uh, testifies and is identified, his whole family is going to get killed by the cartels. He says, can we get the cooperation of INS to bring not only the witness, but his whole family across to protect him? He said, I think I can do that. And I says, fine, then I will get you witnesses. And uh, he said, okay. Then he said, I have another question. He said, uh, could, you, uh, could you kidnap somebody from Mexico for me? And I said, can I kidnap somebody? Uh, he said, yes. I'd like to uh, have one of the perpetrators that we know, a doctor that injected drugs into Camarena. Can you, can you get him kidnapped over here? And I said, of course. He says, you can? And I said, yes. I need about $250,000 and I can get anybody kidnapped. I can even get the president of Mexico kidnapped if you want. He said, are you serious? And I said, I'm dead serious. He said, okay, we'll get you the money. You kidnap that doctor for us, okay? Um, I said, okay, I will. So it took me about three weeks and I had the doctor kidnapped and brought back to the United States, Dr. Humberto Alvarez Machine, who was a doctor that injected uh, lidocaine and different drugs into Kiki to keep him alive when he was being interrogated, Sean, because the body, when it when it when it experiencing a lot of pain, it shuts down to avoid feeling the pain, and so they brought the doctor in to inject him with lidocaine right into his heart. So when Kiki went un uh, unconscious, they would he would inject the lidocaine and bring him back to consciousness, where they would they could continue interrogating him. So I did. And uh, it was a little time I was able to not bring one witness that was percipient at the scene where Kiki was interrogated. I brought three of them, three uh, pistoleros, gunmen that worked for the cartels that were there that could tell us everything uh, that, 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 that Kiki was asked and who interrogated him. Okay, um, I, I want to go backwards. 
because you just shared a lot with us, and I want to break this thing down for, for everybody who's watching this. First and foremost, it, the, the, the narrative has been put out there that Kiki was originally abducted because he was behind the, the burning of a marijuana field that was producing something like $8 billion worth of marijuana annually. Uh, are you saying that that was a false narrative? Partly uh, false because Kiki did not participate in the raids. He he didn't uh, participate in the burning down. You're talking about the Buffalo Fields, Buffalo Chihuahua Fields, where yes. where the cartels had enslaved seven thousand peasants to work uh, in the marijuana fields. There, it was a huge uh, marijuana plantation. Kiki's involvement in that was that they needed, meaning the, the Hermosillo DA office in Mexico City, needed a pilot to fly over before they raided it to ensure and photograph the fields, which was a pilot informant that Kiki had by the name of Alfredo Zavala. So they contacted Kiki and they said, could you have Alfredo fly over the fields and photograph him to ensure that basically what our informants are telling us that the fields are there. Alfredo Zavala flew over those fields, filmed them, brought the film back to Kiki. Kiki then took the film to Guadalajara. That was Kiki's involvement in the case. But the Hermosillo DEA agents and, and the Mexican army, along with uh, agents of the DEA of Mexico City, they raided Buffalo. Kiki had nothing to do with the raids. Okay, so, so the narrative that we have all come to know that, that he was, uh, this was his operation. He was behind it. He participated in the raid. That's untrue. That is not true. Kiki had raided another field a month, a uh, year before. He had raided one of Caro Quintero's fields uh, in Fresnillo, Zacatecas. Now, that one he participated in, and that was his, his case. And that, he was a case agent on that, meaning that was his case. But the Buffalo field, the big ones, Kiki did not participate in those raids. Okay, you were brought over to solve this crime. You, you mentioned you were given a budget. And, and I'm not speaking about the budget to, to abduct the doctor. How large was your budget uh, for informants and in just running this operation annually? Three million a year. Three million a year? Yes, sir. How, how, did, you, how did you use that money? I, I use it to recruit uh, federal, Mexican federal prosecutors as informants. I recruited army generals as informants. I recruited, I recruited federal agents, Mexican federal agents as informants. I recruited homicide detectives as informants. I had a huge informant base that was giving me information. On average, how, how much does an informant go for at that time? I and mean, we're talking the late eighties, mid eighties, late to, to late eighties, correct? Back then, the the informant that I had at Los Pinos, which is uh, Mexico's White House, uh, the the prosecutor that I had on, on payroll there, I was paying them ten thousand dollars every month. Damn, every month. Every month, army generals, I would pay about five thousand a month. Okay, so I got to ask the obvious question. Is there anybody in Mexico then or now that can't be bought? No. Uh, the Mexican police are all on the take. I hired them to do a lot of crazy stuff for me. As the, as the drug dealers buy them to do illegal stuff, murders for them, I would buy them to kidnap people like, like I had the doctor kidnapped. So they're for sale. Let's stick with the doctor for a second. I know you said the doctor was brought in to give Kiki uh, lidocaine to, to make sure he did not pass out. Why were they interrogating him to begin with? Kiki was picked up because he had found out that Caro Quintero was receiving a lot of cocaine at a ranch in Veracruz, Mexico. What Kiki did not know is that that ranch was being used by 
our CIA to train Contras. The CIA was working with the cartels not only to to uh, to, to 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 to, ha to get their assistance in transporting weapons south to the Contras, they were also getting drugs from the cartels, which they were bringing into the United States to support the Contras war in Nicaragua. Now, let me explain to you what was going on back then. Back at that juncture, back in 1978-79, the Daniel Ortega Communist Organization overthrew the Samosa government in, in Nicaragua. The CIA and our DIA military people went to Congress and requested funding to support the Contras war against the communist Daniel Ortega regime. We had just come out of Vietnam, Sean, and Congress says, no, we're not going to get an, involved in another war in South America. No, you, we're not going to fund the war in Nicaragua. So what does the CIA do? They decide they're going to fund the war with drug money. So they become partners with not only the Guadalajara drug cartel at the time, they also become partners with Pablo Escobar. So they're getting money now from Pablo Escobar and the uh, Guadalajara cartel to fund the war. That was one of the ways they were they were they were they were they were getting money to the Contras. Another way was they also sold, as you know, Iran Contra the missiles uh, to Iran, using the Mossad as cover to sell the missiles. And now the money they were getting, they were then using to support this illegal war in Nicaragua. Now, getting back to the Veracruz Ranch, Sean, the Veracruz Ranch was very important to the CIA because that ranch had a, a very large airstrip. And Caro Quintero was using that airstrip, obviously, to bring in um, big, big plane loads of cocaine. So they, 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 they actually rented the ranch from Caro Quintero to train Contras there. And it was, it was, it was strategically located because they could fly the weapons uh, going to the Contras from Veracruz directly into Ilipango, El Salvador, where they were arming the, the Contras with those weapons. And it, it also helped them because any cocaine they were bringing in from Colombia, South America, would be flown from South America to Veracruz, where the military planes were refuel and then continue bringing in the cocaine into different parts of the United States. At the time that this was going on, you had generals like Petraeus and, and Lieutenant uh, uh, Colonel... Um, I forget, it's, uh, Stevens, or I forget, anyway. They were all there training Contras, okay? This is no secret, okay? But they were basically selling the drugs to a black violator by the name of Freeway Ricky Ross at Los Angeles. Now, I knew Ricky Ross, about Ricky Ross because I had worked Los Angeles. And Ricky Ross basically was being provided the drugs by two Contra generals or Contra officials by the name of Danilo Blandon, and Edwin Meneses, the Nino Blendon owned car lots and everything else in the Los Angeles area. Freeway Ricky Ross was then inundating the South Central area with, with cheap crack cocaine. He was providing the Bloods and the Crips with, like I said, very cheap crack cocaine. They caused the cocaine epidemic of the 80s. So now you have a lot of black people, a lot of Hispanics and Puerto Barrios all getting high on crack cocaine. And it was being kept secret that it was being provided by these two Contra officials to Freeway Ricky Ross. That's the story. Now, Kiki, come, now let's go back to Kiki. Kiki Camarena in 85 had found out that at Caro Quintero's ranch, tons of cocaine were being brought through that ranch, he found out. He basically let people know in the government that he was opening up an investigation on that. Kiki Camarena, not knowing Sean, he didn't know anything about the Contras. He didn't know they were training uh, people there. He knew nothing about that. He was going to open up an investigation, so therefore he was kidnapped to be interrogated. Not to be 
to be killed. That's why Kika Moreno was, was bandaged. He was blindfolded. They had planned to find out what he knew, and depending on what he knew, they might let him go. So when they picked him up, elements of the DFS picked him up. Director of Federal Security, which is Mexico CIA, who works under the ages of our CIA. Okay? So therefore, they pick Kiki up, they blindfold him, and they interrogated him. And they start asking him questions about what he knew about the CIA, what he knew about the Contras, and Kiki's telling him, it's on tapes. I heard the tapes. I know nothing about that. I know nothing about Mexican government uh, officials being corrupt. But what has been kept secret is that one of the uh, interrogators was Ismael Felix Rodriguez, a Cuban CIA operative. That's where I crashed because I wanted to have that guy arrested for Kiki's murder. And they said that, no, that I did not have the jurisdiction to investigate the CIA, that I should stay investigating the Mexican cartel leaders. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, this is late 80s. Ronald Reagan's the president, correct? Part of the time, but most of the time it was um, old man Bush. It was old man Bush. Yes, because remember, he had been director of the CIA before that. Exactly. Exactly. Then vice president, then president. So he had his hands all over this thing. Okay, um, where do I want to pick this thing apart? Let's go to, to, to Kiki Camarena's interrogation. You, asked, you answered a question that I was going to ask. Um, they brought him in, and it was originally supposed to be an interrogation, but it turned out to be a torture and a killing. Why and how did it go so far? Because they they knew that Kiki knew about about them bringing in the cocaine at that ranch. They knew because they asked him, and it's right on the tapes, Sean. I heard the tapes. We have transcripts of the tapes. Anybody can view the tapes. They asked Camarena, "What do you know about Veracruz Ranch?" And Kiki answers. I know that Caro Quintero is bringing in tons of cocaine to that ranch. And they even ask him, how do you know? How did you get this information? Who is your informant? Who's telling you this? And he said, Comandante Lorabacchio has wiretaps on Caro Quintero's phones. He has been listening to communications between the ranch and Caro Quintero, and he's the one that told me that Caro Quintero was bringing in a lot of cocaine through that or to that ranch from South America. That's all I know. And they said, no, you know more. You got to know more. And they kept uh, interrogating him. And one of the interrogators was an expert in interrogation, Ismael Felix Rodriguez, a CIA operative. Okay. Um, at this time, this is, this is unprecedented that a DEA agent working for the U.S. government would be kidnapped and tortured. That, that's never been done before. So that is correct. Who made the decision, okay, this is no longer an interrogation. This guy's a liability. We got to take him out. The ultimate decision to kill him was made, but after, after Rodriguez and the CIA people had interrogated him, they left. And... Um, Carl Quintero was one that, that basically decided that he should be killed. As a matter of fact, the cartel boss was not there when, when, um, when he made the decision to, that, that, that they should kill him, which is uh, Fonseca. Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo wasn't there. But when his agents that were there heard that Carl Quintero had given the order to kill Kiki, he called him. And he says, boss, you better get over here. He says, because Caro Quintero has made the decision to kill Kiki. We kill Camarena. He says, tell him to stop everything. I'm on my way over there right now. So Fonseca drives from his house to the location where Kiki's being tortured still. 
and he he orders Caro Quintero not to kill him. He says, don't kill him. That was not the plan. We're not supposed to kill this guy. And he said, I have orders from Manuel Barlet Diaz, the secretary of government, that he should be killed. And Fonseca says, listen, don't kill him. I don't care who give you the order. And he slaps Caro Quintero, almost knocks him to the ground. And he says, this is going to be your problem. This is going to be a major problem. This guy was not supposed to be killed. But he says, we can't save him anymore. He says, he's, he's too far gone because they had beat him too much. And then, and then Fonseca asked, asked the doctor, my shine, the guy that I can't ask him, he says, can you save this guy? And he says, the only way we can save him is by taking him by ambulance to a hospital. He's too far gone. And Caro Quintero says, no, you're not taking him. As a matter of fact, they, Fonseca's men and Caro Quintero's men pointed rifles at each other. And uh, so finally Fonseca gets very upset. He says, it's going to be your, it's going to be your baby. You're going to carry this problem. And he walks out mad. That is a fact. That's what went down. I have three witnesses that were there that have told us that. Okay, just for the sake of clarity in this story, because you mentioned a lot of people, um, Cara Quintero, um, you have heads of cartels, CIA, DFS, all in the same room while this DEA agent was getting kidnapped, tortured, and killed, all working together? Yes, sir. <laughs> I got to ask, for somebody like you, as this story is unraveling, you've been on the side of fighting crime for the better part of your life. How blown away are you or or do you just know this is the way the game is played? You know, I was very blown away and I really got blown away because a lot of people don't know that I recruited a CIA operative and made him my informant. I was told that there was a white guy working for the DFS, a big, tall, white guy. They called him Torre Blanca, White Tower. And I said, why do they call him that? I said, because he builds repeaters for the, for the DFS and the CIA. He's a communications es expert. And I said, oh, really? What's his real name? He said, we don't know, but he goes by Larry, but his nickname is White Tower Torre Blanca. So I sent an informant to, 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 to hook me up with this guy. And my informant went and he knew him, and he went and met him. And he said, um, he, he said Hector wants to talk to you. He said, I don't know who Hector is. I don't want to talk to him. He says, you better talk to Hector. So he says, okay, I'll talk to him. So he came on the line and I says, Larry, I said, I know who you are. I know you work for the DFS and I need you to come and help me solve this crime. He said, Hector, you're, you're really threatening in very dangerous waters. You don't even know what's going on down here and I'm not going to cooperate with you. And he hung up on me. So I, I, I called the informant back and I said, tell him to come back on the phone just for one second. So he put him back on the phone and I says, Larry, I'm gonna kidnap your white ass. You're either gonna cooperate with me or else I'm gonna kidnap your white ass. You understand that? And we're talking in plain English. He said, he says, he says, you're gonna kidnap me? You're not gonna kidnap me. He says, I am gonna kidnap you. Didn't I just kidnap that doctor? He says, I promise you, dude, I'm gonna kidnap your, your, your white ass. And he hung up on me again. And then three days later, he calls me back and he said, Hey, he says, you're really going to kidnap me, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. I said, you're, uh, you're, you're, you know a lot. You work for the DFS, dude. Come on. So he said, okay, I'll come. Send a plane to come get me. But I don't want nobody to know that I'm coming. Please. I'm going to demand this of you that nobody knows that I'm going to come to L.A. to talk to you. So he came in. And so we sit down in a hotel room. And he says, Hector, you don't even know what, what you got here. He says, we killed Camarena. And I looked at him and I says, what do you mean we killed Camarena? Maybe you killed Camarena. Don't, I didn't kill Camarena, dude. He said, you don't get it, dude? I mean, we, the U.S. government. I said, what are you talking about? I said, who do you think I work for, dude? How do you think, you think any white guy can just walk in and get a job with the DFS? I'm a CIA operative, dude. I said, what? I work for the CIA. 
I says, now I've become a double agent. I'm going against my own agency. He says, here's what's going on. He says, we're involved in Rancho Veracruz. I set up the towers over there. I met Barry Seal down there, very famous CIA pilot. He was bringing in tons of cocaine, flying them in. I was the one that set up the communication towers at the ranch so that the people at the ranch could communicate, um, you know, com communicate uh, with, with the planes coming in from South America. I was there three months. He said, and I met, and he told me, and I met Colonel Steele, and I met Joe Petraeus, and some of our guys that are training the Contras there. We are, he said, uh, basically funding this war with drug money. And Camarena he says, basically stumbled into it and said he was going to investigate the, Ver the Veracruz Ranch, and that's what cost him his life. And I'll tell you something, Sean. What I'm telling you, Larry Harrison and I testified before U.S. Congress. Was this conversation recorded? Yes, sir. You have White Tower telling you we killed Kiki Camarena yes, on sir. tape. Yes, sir. The first time in the history of DEA that DEA had recruited a CIA operative as a, as a source. Basically, he became, he became a double agent. He started telling me about what the CIA was doing in Mexico. He told me that he was initially sent there uh, as a English instructor at the University of Guadalajara, but his real mission was not to t teach English. His real mission was to identify leftist guerrilla students, or leftist students, excuse me, not guerrilla, leftist students of the 23rd of September, and that he reported them back to his control agent, Felix Rodriguez, that the CIA was picking up these students and killing them all. And he said, yeah, I had blood all over my hands. And I didn't want to do it anymore. So then the CIA reassigned me to be the communications officer for the DFS. And that's how I got to Rancho Veracruz. Damn, this story gets deep. Uh, by any chance, is he still alive this, to this day? No, he died last year, unfortunately. Larry Harrison died. Um, did he ever... Get arrested, convicted, do any time, or did his role kind of end there? His uh, job with the CIA obviously ended there, but you know he was a very he was a very intelligent guy. He had a law degree. He practiced law here in the LA area. <laughs> so after the CIA, he loses that job. He comes back home and he practices law in LA until last year. That's right. Unbelievable. Okay. A um, couple of things I want to circle back to. You kidnapping the doctor. What did you learn from the doctor once you got him stateside? The doctor, when I, first of all, when I had him kidnapped and I, I got him, he admitted to me that he was at the scene, that he had treated Camarena, but he said that his intentions were not to kill him that he was there basically trying to keep him alive. That's the confession he gave me, and then, of course, that's all he would say. But he did admit to me in writing, gave me a declaration in writing that he had participated in treating Camarena when the, when the uh, drug lords were torturing him. Okay. Was he ever put on trial? He was put on trial and mysteriously was released by a federal judge. You got to elaborate on that. What, what do you mean mysteriously was released? Well, we went to trial, and we had uh, testimony by witnesses that were there that they saw him treat Camarena. We also had picked up at the location where Kiki was tortured, we had picked up laundry bags. And uh, one of the witnesses testified that he had seen the doctor depriving Kiki of oxygen by putting the, the laundry bags over Camarena's neck to keep to deprive him of oxygen. And we found those laundry bags at the scene with the doctor's palm prints and fingerprints. And the, the judge said that he was going to let him go for insufficient evidence, and he did. When the jury heard that testimony, 
and you can go back and check in the newspapers, they were very upset at the judge because the jurors said they would have convicted him. He stopped the trial and said, I, don't, I haven't heard, you guys haven't given me enough evidence of his involvement. Later, we found out that this judge had been appointed uh, by George Bush. <laughs> and I was about to ask you that. I was literally about to ask you, was this a judge appointed by the president? Okay. Um, we, we, we talked briefly about the cartels. At this time, how many cartels existed? Was it just the Guadalajara cartel? Back then, it was just one cartel run by one drug lord, Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, who ran the cartel with an iron fist. He basically would not permit assassinations uh, unless they were, they, were, they, were, they were sanctioned by him. If anybody was to be killed, they would have like a little hearing, like the Italian mob kind of thing. It was controlled. They couldn't go out and just kill an ordinary citizen or rape a girl or something because he, 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 would, he would have you killed. So it was kind of really controlled by him. After we arrested him when we, des we destroyed the Guadalajara cartel, then all these other independent cartels started springing up, like the Sinaloa now, the Nueva Generacion, the Zetas. Uh, all, all those other cartels started springing up after that. Okay. Is, is Carrillo, is, is that Don Neto? Don Neto. Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. Don Neto, yes. Okay. Where, where does uh, Felix Gallardo and, and Rafa fall into this? Because they were, weren't they all partners? Okay, they were they were partners. However, Phyllis Gallardo was ma ma mainly involved in smuggling and distributing cocaine. Carl Quintero, remember, he was mainly involved in the Sensemilla growing all the marijuana. He was in charge of Buffalo, yep. which was destroyed. So they worked together. They had Cochiloco, Felix Gallardo, Carlos Quintero, uh, El Azul, uh, Juan Esparragosa Moreno, El Chapo Guzman. El Chapo, well, by the way, was there when Kiki was being tortured. Um, in the same room? El Chapo Guzman. He was in that same room? Yes, sir. He was okay, one of I the want guys. you to go. He was one of, the, one of the, the persons that tortured Kiki Camarena. As a matter of fact, it was El Chapo and Felix Gallardo's crew that went and picked up the pilot at the airport. Uh, that they brought in and and, and faith, you know they did a face to face with Kiki. He was a pilot that was buried alive in Kiki's uh, grave, Alfredo Savala. He was buried alive. Damn. Okay. I want to I, I want to get to um, El Chapo, but I want to go back and and stay where we were at in in terms of you breaking down the leadership of the Guadalajara um, cartel. You, you, for anybody who's watched Narcos. It appeared that uh, Felix Gallardo was, he was the, the brain. He was the mastermind who put it all together. But to speaking to you, you, you're giving me the sense that Don Neto, um, Ernesto Carrillo, what was, the, was the actual mastermind in the head of, of that cartel at that time. That Do is I have the, that correct? Th 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 that is absolutely correct. Uh, mind you, uh, Felix Gallardo was a capo in that cartel, but he wasn't the, the jefe de jefes. Carlo Quintero was also a, a capo. And there were others, like uh, later, uh, the guy that runs the Sinaloa cartel now, El Mayo Zambada. They were all like capos because they ran different areas. But the number one, it's called jefe de jefe, boss of bosses, was Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. Why was he so respected and why was he the jefe de jefes? Because he spoke to presidents, he was uh, uh, he owned banks. He was a then a, a billionaire back then, and uh, would visit the presidents at uh, Los Pinos. I mean, he was the one that had the connections with all aspects of the federal Mexican federal government. Okay, w were you part of the team who took down um, Felix Gallardo, uh, Rafael Quintero, and? Car Carrillo? Yes, sir. How much were they worth when these guys were arrested? Uh, well, we found uh, some of Caro Quintero's money in Luxembourg and, um, and uh, Cayman Islands, and I think he was worth like almost a billion dollars when he was 32 years old. 
Uh, Felix Gallardo was also a billionaire. And right now, Hermayo Zambada is worth close to $10 billion. And I'll remind you, that's a lot of money. There's a thousand million in one billion. And we're talking 80s, early 90s. That's correct. And these guys were billionaires. Yes. Barely into their 30s. That's correct. Damn. Okay. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, 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 you got to put this in perspective, Sean. Why would the cartels that had impunity making all that money, why would they want to ruin what they had by killing Kiki? Exactly. They didn't have to. They were used. I'm telling you. It was the order came from here. Let's pick up Kiki. Let's find out what he knows. We're in trouble back here with Iran right now. We're having hearings on, 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 on uh, uh, the U.S. providing uh, missiles to Iran. And if this thing of us, of the U.S. being involved in drug trafficking has ever aired, this is going to be very devastating to the, to the, to the, to the political party in, at, at the time. The, the administration, which was the Bush administration at the time, they would have, they would, they, would you imagine if this would have been exposed by then? So they had to keep a lid on it. And that's why Kiki was brought in. They wanted to know what he knew and was he going to expose the fact that the CIA was in bed with the cartels down there and training Contras in, in, a, in a cartel member's ranch. And that's all a fact. Now, here's the thing that I want to make very clear also. I am always accused of lying that's all a conspiracy theory. Hector's lying. He got these witnesses to, to basically lie for him, what have you. My answer to that is, if I'm lying about anything, if I committed subornation of perjury and lied, because I've testified to, to all of this, and not only in, in court, but also in congressional hearings, why haven't they arrested me? Subornation of perjury is a major felony. And if I lie to you right now or anybody about this very serious situation, why haven't I not been arrested? If I made all this stuff up, what's going on here? And I always get, you know, asked, well, you know, we talked to the DEA and, and the CIA saying this is not true and that you made all this up and you got these people. I say, I tell them, if I'm lying, I should, especially making these very serious allegations, then put me in jail, right? You know, where, where a liar should be. They can't put me in jail because you know what? I can prove all this stuff and they know it's true. So they just say, oh, it's, it's, it's not true. That, that whole thing you see on, uh, the last narc, uh, the series by Tiller Russell. Oh, that, that, that's all bunk. That's not true. If it's not true, then, then, then prove it. Yeah, because you're making extremely serious allegations about the U.S. government, uh, especially the CIA in particular, that they were inundating the streets of the U.S. with drugs to support a war. I, I, I would think that if uh, you weren't indicted, arrested, there would be attempts on your life. Have you been threatened? Have there been any uh, attempts on your life that we haven't heard about? The only threat that I actually received right before I, first of all, I was forced to retire. I was given a, a not very pleasant assignment in Washington, D.C. in order not to investigate any 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 of the Camarena thing anymore or not to investigate anything, period. And they ordered me to stay away from my sources. When I was about to retire and put in my papers, they told me, remember, Hector, you are wanted in Mexico. There's a warrant for your arrest for kidnapping the doctor. And if you go out there and open your mouth, you, you might find yourself in a Mexican prison. The warrant is still outstanding for you. So be a good soldier, enjoy your retirement, and keep your mouth shut. That's the only threat that I had that I can initially be threatened. And basically, I was told that I had, a, I had a warrant for my arrest for kidnapping the doctor, which, by the way, I was ordered by the director of the DEA to kidnap, who, by the way, now denies it, that he ever ordered me to do it. How am I going to kidnap was, a man without... Was, I'm, and I'm so sorry to cut in. Who was the director of the DEA at that point? Jack Long. And, and he gave you the order, yes, sir. the okay, 
to to kidnap that doctor. Yes, sir. And provided me the money to pay the kidnappers. $250,000. Yes, sir. And now he says that he that, 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 that I did not kidnap him. Remember, if you go back and you look at the news right after I kidnapped the doctor, the DEA threw me under the bus. The headlines of the Washington Post were kidnapping a doctor by rogue renegade DEA agent Hector Berreus. And then it says, Kidnap, doc, keeping up, the doctor was not authorized by DEA. Huh. Look at the papers. Okay. I mean, you, you, you can research it. It's all, it's all, it was all news back then. How, how many people were actually indicted um, behind the death of Kiki Camarena? I think that we had like a total of 19 indictments. I think we only brought to to trial like eight eight other defendants, which most of them got life terms. Okay, were any of these um, defendants the head of the Guadalajara? No. Cartel? We, could, we could never no. touch those guys. Most of the defendants were uh, uh, major drug dealers, uh, but uh, they were not like the heads of anything. And they all got life sentences here in the U.S.? Yes, sir. Okay, you brought up um, El Chapo, who is currently serving time here in the U.S. Did you ever have any interaction with him when he was on the street? No, uh, I knew about him. I didn't really know his real name. I just know that there was El Chapo who was there by the witnesses. They didn't, they couldn't remember his name, who said that he participated in, in kicking and torturing Camarena and that he had been assigned to go to the airport to pick up the pilot that, that 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 actually photographs the field that I talked about, because Camarena gave the pilot up in, his, in 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 the beating he was getting, he basically gave the pilot's name up. So they then said, okay, well, let's go grab the pilot. So they get a team together, headed by Felix Gallardo who was there, and Chapo Guzman was with that team. Him and Huero Palma, another major trafficker, they they were part of the team that went and picked up the, the pilot, brought him back to the house. And they basically, they, they confronted uh, the pilot with Kiki. They were trying to get information from both of them. He was, the pilot was also tor tortured, but um, he was, like I said, neither, neither one of them were really dead when they took him and buried him. They were both alive. And uh, we know because there was dirt in their lungs, so they breathed a lot, of, a lot of dirt when they were buried. So the pilot was buried alive. That's so horrible. That's so horrible. Okay, within that room, you spoke about uh, uh, a CIA agent, if you will. Um, this guy was very mysterious, but he was pretty much behind uh, the capturing and torturing of Kiki. What, what, what is his? Is is his name Max something? Okay. When I remember when I brought up the witnesses, I didn't bring them all together. I brought one uh -huh. witness up. And he, when I would, because I, I had a book of all the suspects and, and, and photograph, and I would ask him, was this guy there? Was that guy there? Was this guy there? And they would say, yeah, he was there. And then I would write a report as to who they, who the witness, let's say, identified from the photo lineup as to having been there at the scene torturing Camarena. Uh, somebody had that, that told me that there was a guy, well, one of the first witnesses, there was a guy there, there was a Cuban there interrogating Kiki. And I said, a Cuban? Why would a Cuban be there? And I said, what was the Cuban's name? He's, uh, he says he was, his name was uh, Max Gomez. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. So, I, you know, we ran Max Gomez through all our databases, NCIC, uh, the Treasury uh, database, all of them, NADAS, and nothing would come up, Sean, on this Cuban guy, Felix Rodriguez. Six months, eight months later, we bring another witness that was that was also there at the scene that decided they brought, that was going to cooperate. Again, he says there was a Cuban guy that was interrogating Kiki a lot. A Cuban guy? He says, yes. He says, what was his name? He says his name was uh, Felix, uh, Max Gomez. Max Gomez? I said, I've heard that name. Are you sure his name was Gomez? He says, that's, that's what he, everybody called him, Max Gomez. And then finally, a year later, that third witness comes up, who was very close to Fonseca. 
And I'm going through the book, too, and asking him who was there and everything else. And, and he says, who else was there that might not be in this book? He says there was a Cuban guy who went by Max Gomez, but that was his CIA undercover name. He was a CIA operative, and his real name is Ismael Felix Rodriguez. Boom. Three years later. So then I ran Ismael Felix Rodriguez through all of our databases, or databases, excuse me, and I find out this guy is a CIA operative. And I find out that this guy was the same guy that captured Che Guevara in South America. And I found out that the same guy was involved in Watergate. And I found out that this guy was very close to old man Bush. Then I found out that this guy was also involved in the Bay of Pigs. Older guy. And I said, I'll be darned. And I checked with those guys and I said, are you sure this guy? He said, yeah, said, no, he was there. He was there. And then they say, he was also at pre-adoption meetings. I said, were they planned Kiki's murder? Yes, he was part of the American team that was coming down and meeting with the government officials here and the DFS when we dis they discussed uh, picking up Kiki Camarena. I said, whoa. I was shocked. I, I, I got to believe, again, now here we go again. Uh, it, it, it's another CIA operative that <laughs> comes out of the woodworks. Do, do you trust the government you're working for at this moment? No, I don't. I, I I have to believe sitting in your seat and realizing that this guy, Max Gomez, who is is under an alias, um, what's his name? Ismael Felix Rodriguez is his real name. Felix Rodriguez is not only a CIA operative, but he's great friends with old man Bush. And he's carrying out all of these high-profile operations all over the world. What does someone like you do at that moment? Because I'm surprised you didn't get shut down earlier. I was shut down early. That, 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 and that's, where, that's when they shut the investigation down, when I got to that level in the investigation, John. That's when they shut it down. So when you got to, to Max Gomez, that was it? That was it. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, let's talk about <laughs> the heads of the Guadalajara cartel. All three go down. Um, Felix Gallero, he did, how, how much time does he eventually get? He did like 20-some uh, uh, years. He just got out on humanitarian uh, reasons, he's uh, not in good health. So the Mexican government being compassionate, you know, I let him go. He's on a house arrest right now. So he's literally walking the streets yes, after 20 something years. Yes, sir. How much time was he originally sentenced to? 40 years. Okay, what about his partner, Rafa? Rafa was also released on, on false pretenses. He was out free for a while and uh, decided that he was going to be a cartel member again. Uh, and he was running around here last year, two years ago, uh, running a cartel out of Sonora, Mexico. And he was just uh, arrested again for I don't know what reason, but he, he's in jail right now. But he had, he, he's not being charged with a Camarena case anymore. He was just being charged with uh, trafficking in drugs. And uh, Fonseca also did about, out of about 40 years since, I think he did like 20-some years Excuse me. And he's also free now and living, living at home, walking the streets. So these guys are all out of jail. Um, excuse me, with the exception of Rafa, who decides he wants to get back in the business. Did he get back in the business? Did they even need the money anymore? Did, did you guys seize all of their assets? Did they have anything left? Of course, the, the Mexican govern, government never seized any other assets. We seized some of uh, Quintero's assets, like, like I said, out of um, 
Luxembourg and uh, the Cayman Islands, but mo most of them were allowed to keep their money. So they're millionaires still. They're not, they're so, not poor. So, so what would be the motivation for somebody like Raphael to get back in the, in the business? He just liked being a drug lord. He, he loved that lifestyle. He, he, he wanted the respect and wanted to be a drug lord again. You know, that's all it was. He didn't need the money. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong. The U.S. government, didn't they put out a $20 million reward for his uh, capture? It's still uh, outstanding to this day, yes. But if he's, if, if he's behind bars... How come he hasn't been extradited? Because the Mexican government will not extradite him. They won't extradite him over here. We've asked. Was there a difference between him and El Chapo? Because obviously the Mexican government worked closely with the U.S. government to bring um, El Chapo here. Why, why are the rules different for, for Rafael Quintero? Because El Chapo was never really a major, he was never ahead of anything. El Chapo was a very prolific uh, uh, dealer, but he was never in charge of the Sinaloa cartel or nothing. Uh, you know, El Chapo uh, and uh, Huero Palma were just factions of the old Guadalajara cartel. Actually, they made Chapo bigger than what he is. He's not a, he wasn't a, a major cartel boss, where Carlos Quintero was, was a, a boss. Okay, so let's stop there. Again, I, I, I'm only going with the narrative that, that we hear um, every day in the media. We were under the assumption or we have been told that El Chapo was the boss of the Sinaloa cartel. No. Th that's not correct? That's not correct. The boss of the Sinaloa cartel has always been Ismael Zambada, El Mayo Ismael El Mayo Zambada. They call him El Mayo. He has always been and continues to be the head of the Sinaloa cartel. Chapo, Chapo worked underneath him. That's a fact. Okay, so why does Chapo get credit for being the boss? He, he, he was a, a, a lower boss, but he was, I don't know why people make him to be the boss. He was never the boss. Anybody that knows cartels like I know them will tell you he was never a main boss. As a matter of fact, Chapo is not that bright. He's only got like a third grade education. He's kind of a really not considered to be very smart. How violent was he back in the day? Chapo was respected and feared because he was an executioner for uh, Fonseca. He was the kind of guy that would be used to... Um, kill people, bury them, and stuff like that. He, he, he worked with uh, 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 three brothers that were called Los Dormidos. They called them the sleepers because when they wanted to kill somebody, they would get Chapo and the, and the Los Dormidos to go execute the guy and then go bury him. As a matter of fact, El Chapo and the Dormidos were the ones that unburied Camarena, okay, when we put pressure on the Mexican government, when they threw him over there at the ranch where we found him. It was El Chapo and the Dormidos that actually unearthed the body. A lot of people don't know that. I know it. It's been no, documented. this is the first I'm hearing of this. You know, another thing, that, Sean, that bothered me too is when El, when, El, when El Chapo was arrested, how come they didn't charge him with the Camarena murders? He was there. You tell me. I don't know. What? I didn't indict him back then because I told you I didn't know his real name. I just knew him as El Chapo, but I couldn't get an indictment on a nickname, so I couldn't indict him. Later, when it was proven to be, you know, who he is, um, whatever his name is, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, Guzman Loera, Ismael Guzman Loera, now they've indicted him and everything else, but only for drug trafficking. Why was he not charged with Kiki's murder? He was up to his butt involved in that stuff, not only interrogating Kiki, and torturing him, burying him, and all also bringing him out of the hole months later when we put pressure that we needed to find Kiki's body. He was one of the guys that dumped the bodies over there in Michoacan where we found him. The government knows this. This story runs, I mean, like literally, this runs so deep. 
it, it's almost unbelievable if it was not coming from your mouth, from somebody who was there and worked on this thing night and day, it would almost seem like a Hollywood script. You know, Sean, who are the victims? We are the victims. Look at all the crack cocaine babies. Look at all the all 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 all, all the all the people that that got that got hooked up on crack cocaine back then. Look at all the people that were arrested and made felons because they got them with a not even an ounce of that crap when the CIA was bringing in tons. That's what upsets me, and that's what set me off. And I said, I can't be I can't be part of this. You know, I felt like I had a conscience here. I had to tell the truth. And Sean, I couldn't tell the truth for for a long time because I had that warrant outstanding in Mexico where I was threatened. I said, if you put this stuff out, you, you're going to find yourself in a Mexican prison, you know? So, and I'm like I said, I'm sitting here. If I'm lying, then prove me wrong. If you're saying that Felix Rodriguez did not interrogate Kiki Camarena, then bring a couple of witnesses that will say that the witnesses that I produced are lying. But they can't, they don't, they just say, oh, that's not true. It's a conspiracy thing. You know, I, and I say to them, well, prove me wrong. Bring me two or three guys that were also there. There was a lot of people there when Kiki was being tortured to say that Rodriguez wasn't there. They don't do it. Well, Rodriguez says that he was uh, doing something else. He's a CIA operative. They could make up anything. They could make. They could put him in Africa at that time if they want to. I mean, come on. If, if yeah. this is all, yeah. if this is all, if this is all, if this is all uh, figment of my imagination, then then why did I testify before Congress? Why have I, uh, you know, why have I, have, if I'm if I'm crazy or whatever, which they've even said that I'm crazy to come up with this kind of stuff. Okay, then why why was I permitted to basically testify before major congressional hearings in, in, in Washington and look at all the trials I've testified and look at all the people I've arrested and convicted? It, it, needless to say, you've never been back to Mexico, correct? Never. Is there, I mean, I understand that there's a, a, a warrant for your arrest out there for the kidnapping but is there a price on your head? Well, the warrant, you know the, the warrant honestly has already expired because after after twenty years it expired. Uh, okay. That I, that 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 I'll kill if I go to Mexico. Absolutely. Uh, I I don't know that they've got a price on my head. I'm not going to say that. You know, I wouldn't last. Uh, you know, if I get arrested in Mexico, uh, you know, for anything, I wouldn't last a week alive in a Mexican prison. And by the way, they were thinking about my own government was thinking about sending me down south, are giving me up to the Mexicans. You know that for a fact? I know that for a fact. I, I know that from a deputy administrator, Lima Field Jordan, who was at a meeting when then acting director Terry Burke suggested sending me to Mexico uh, for kidnapping the doctor. And the deputies that were there said, well, yeah, but if we send Hector to Mexico, you know, they'll kill him down there. And basically he just kind of shrugged, like, that's my point. And uh, they said, well, you know, how can we send him to Mexico when we all know the truth that he was ordered by our former director, Jack Lon, to kidnap the doctor? That would be an assass outright assassination of the guy. But that was discussed. Don't take my word for it. You can get Phil Jordan. He'll tell you he was at the meeting. He'll tell you who was there at that meeting, too. As a matter of fact, he called me. And he said, Hector, if they, if they, if they call you to Washington for a meeting, don't come. The FBI is going to arrest you and they're going to extradite you to Mexico for kidnapping the doctor. So he says, well, what do I do? It says, I have a warrant for my arrest. I'm in Interpol. I said, I can't even run to another country. He said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm just telling you. They're thinking about sending you to Mexico. Um, that doctor, after his case was thrown out, isn't it true that he turned around and sued either you or the U.S. government? Yes, and it was uh, the suit went nowhere. He sued the U.S. government, and he sued me personally. I couldn't borrow money to buy uh, to buy a pencil back then. My I had a five million dollar lawsuit hanging on my in my credit. I couldn't buy a house or nothing. For how long was was your life, uh, I guess, put on pause with this lawsuit? For well, about five years, five six years. And eventually it was thrown out. Eventually it was thrown out, of course. You know, it was thrown out. Unbelievable. Okay. Um, 
I want to turn to your personal life, if you will, uh, for a second. Y- your son, I believe it it was your oldest or, or your youngest son. Well, I I gave a lot for the for the agency and for my country. And one of mm-hmm. the things that I really dread uh, was not being around for my children. And uh, my oldest son uh, took his life. And that really, that really took me for a spin. If I was ever down, depressed, that was when my son, uh, you know, took his life. And uh, one of the things that he said was that nobody loved him. So I, I carried that, and I still carry that deeply in my heart. Uh, I wasn't around for my kids. I was, as I told you, I was out of country a lot of times. I was with, I, w- I was not with him when, when I was in dangerous countries. So I couldn't bring him. So there was a lot of birthdays, baseball games, and family uh, things that uh, I did not participate in, and I feel very guilty about that to this day. I would not recommend anybody to go work with a DEA or be a, a government agent. When he did take his life, uh, were you stateside? Yes, sir. I was. I, he uh, he was living in Arizona, and I was living in California. How how was your relationship with him? Uh, in his final days, did you guys have a chance to bond? I know he said nobody loved him, but did you have any moments of at least trying to get that relationship back on track, not knowing that this is the way it would end? Yes, uh, we we had talked like a, a week or two before he was he was coming to California, and him and my other son Chris had planned to. Uh, uh, set up a campsite on the beach, and and as a matter of fact, they they went out and bought Coleman lamps and and sleeping bags, and they we were planning a big a big uh, camping trip uh, here. He was coming, he was driving up from California, and so, so we had been talking to him. I mean, we had I had a good relationship with with him. When he said that that he nobody loved him was because his wife was cheating on him with another man, and she had told him that she was gonna leave him and go live with the other man, which he did. And um, one night uh, he went out and drank a little too much, I guess, and he came home and and he had his kids there because he had two kids before he got with her. And uh, he uh, he just took his life and he, he told his kids, nobody loves me and and took his life. I, I, I don't think he was referring to me. I think he was referring more to his woman. I'm so sorry to hear that. My condolences. I, I, I hear the hurt in your voice, even as you're telling this story. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Again, my condolences, and I'm so, so sorry. Because like you said, you have given so much um, to this country, to the government, um, to us, for our freedoms. You know, it, it hasn't been an easy ride for you. And this is happening right before you were essentially forced into retirement, correct? That's correct. So your life, it went from being somewhat of a of a superhero, a decorated agent for many years, to all of a sudden pain, sorrow, and life as you know it came completely to an end. What, what did you do after retirement? Well, like I said, I went to, for a while there. I went through a very major depression, and I reevaluated my life, Sean. And I started thinking, you know, here I've killed people for the government. I have taken lives. More than the one shootout that I had uh, talked about earlier, I made another shootout where I had to kill other people. And I had a reflection and thought, what was it all about? Here, I got involved in shootouts with drug dealers that were dealing little drugs, a pound or two of coke or heroin or what have you, when my own government was bringing in tons. And I thought to myself, how can I continue doing this job? I can't. I can't continue doing this job because I don't believe in this job anymore. There's no equal justice here. If if you're poor, I don't care if you're black, white, Mexican. If you're poor and you're out there committing a crime to try to support your family, which is drug dealing, and, and, and I'm, I'm arresting you and putting you away for 15, 20 years. And then I know that our government is bringing in 
drugs by the ton load. And I know that our country has caused the cocaine epidemic of the 80s and 90s. All the blacks that were uh, having cracked babies and the Chicanos all, all, all arrested and all. You know, I started, I started thinking, what was my career all about? I mean, seriously, how do you think I feel? You think I would want to go out and arrest anybody right now? I can't. And they can deny it all they want. They can, they can say, well, it's not true. It is true. At, at this point in your life, do you sleep through the night? Is, is there a moment's peace? Because what you just said, the gravity of it, the magnitude of it, I mean, it cuts deep. And, 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 and it is, it's sincere. And it's the truth. You know, there, there are guys that are locked up that will never come home, that never sold a quarter, a quarter of the weight of the drugs that the U.S. government brought into this country. Have you found any peace? Have you found a way to live with yourself and, 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 and sleep through the night? Like I said, Sean, it does bother me a lot. It doesn't bother me too much when I think of the people that I arrested. It bothers me when I think of the people that I killed. That bothers me because they're, not, they're no longer alive. And they weren't selling tons, maybe a pound or two of heroin or something like that. And they just didn't want to get arrested. And they pulled guns, so it was gunplay, and people people got shot, people got killed. And I say to myself now, um, God, forgive me. You know, one of the shootouts that I was involved in, um, it, was a, it, was, it was three guys that were armed. They were from Sinaloa, from the Sinaloa cartel. And... Um, they delivered the heroin. I gave the bus signal. And when the, my agents were coming in to make the arrest, they started pulling out guns. So I, I shot and killed one of them. And when he was laying there, actually my partner and I, Bobby Bags, uh, both, we both shot him and killed him. But he was laying there uh, in the ground. And his last words were, Manny, forgive me, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm stepping on his arm because he's still laying there with a gun. And I see his eyes roll back, and he dies. And to this day, it haunts me because I tell you to myself, was he telling me he was sorry because he knew I was a DEA agent and he knew he was done something wrong? Or was he telling me he was just sorry for being a bad guy? I don't know. But that's what he told me. He says, forgive me, I'm so sorry. After I shot him and killed him. I mean, that bothers me a lot sometimes. I, I have nightmares about that. He called you Manny. That was my undercover so name. That was your undercover name. Yes. So do you think that even in the end, he didn't realize that you work for the government? I don't know. That's what, I, that's what bothers me. Did he really think I was still a crook? But, but I shot him. He must have known I shot him. But did he apologize to me? And he said he was sorry. I don't know. To this day, I don't know if he thought I was still a crook or if he knew that I was a federal agent and I had, had shot him uh, in the chest, by the way, and uh, very close range. I don't know. It bothers me to this day. Yeah. I, you know, John, let me tell you a little story here before we end. Uh, uh, before I retired, I was asked to give a... Um, a presentation of the Camarena case to all the sacks of the entire DEA. And it was up here in Northern California at Morro Bay. We had a conference room. And, uh, you know, I was an undercover guy. I hardly ever wore a suit or a tie or anything like that. I was, I always dressed cowboy like I am because I'm a cowboy, Western. And uh, so my sack calls me in and he says, uh, Hector, he says, uh, I want you, they, they want you to give a presentation of the Camarena murder case. Uh, so I want you to do that. But he says, would you do me a favor? And I said, what's that, boss? He said, would you dress in a suit? Would you have a, wear a nice suit with a tie, please? And I said, I will. I said, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll dress in a suit. So 
the morning of the uh, of the conference, I I, I put my, wore my suit, and I always carried my gun on my waist. And I thought, you know what? I can't carry a gun like this in front of all these sacks. So I said, mm, I'm going to wear a shoulder holster, which I had bought a long time ago. It was brand new. I had never worn it, my shoulder holster. So I said, I'll wear a shoulder holster and my coat over it. So I did. So I, had, I ended up getting at the conference there, and finally my turn comes up to brief the, the, uh, the sacks. And I'm getting up there, and I have photographs of Caro Quintero and Fonseca and all the drug lords and blah, blah. And it's warm, so I take my coat off, and I have my gun in a shoulder holster. And the deputy administrator of the DEA says to me, Hector, is that gun necessary? And it kind of upset me that he asked me that. And I said, you know what? And I was behind the microphone. I said, you know what? When I will go undercover sometimes, I don't carry a gun. But when I'm here with you guys, I need my gun. <laughs> 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 and a lot of them started laughing. But that's the way I really felt. I felt a lot of times more comfortable with the crooks. I found that some of the crooks were more honorable than some of the guys that I worked for, with in the DEA. Wow. Wow. Um, before I let you out of here, your your book, um, The Last Narc, you got it with you. Yes, sir, I do. It's right here. The Last Narc. What was your motivation to write this book? And where can we go find it? First of all, my motivation to write the book was because when I was working for the DEA, I could only trust one person who I would always consult and tell the truth, which was my father. And I would come and tell my father, who was an uneducated laborer, who was a bricklayer, that this is going on and that's going on. And I knew my father could keep a secret. So one day my father told me, he says, son, please write a book. You have to write a book. You have to let the people know the truth about this Camarena murder. And and I would tell my dad, I don't know, Dad, if I should write a book, you know, it's so serious. He says, please, son, you owe it to humanity. You have to write the book. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll write the book. But then he had a major heart attack, and he was at the hospital, and the doctor said, I have to, I have to t let you guys know that I have to go back in again um, and he might die. So uh, I, I can, I, 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 I operate on him, but he's not doing well. I have to go in again and he's probably not going to make it. So say your goodbyes to your dad now. So I went into the room where he was and I said, dad, it's not looking good. He says, I know. He said, tell him not to operate on me, Hector. I, I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And I said, Dad, we have to have him operate on you. You know, you might make it. So anyway, he says, I listen, son. Remember what I, I, I asked you to promise me. And I said, what, Dad? You had to write that book. And I wrote the book for him. Wow. Wow. Very deep. You know, I, I I did see the last narc um, on Amazon, and and I also saw uh, part of your stories on uh, Narcos Mexico. Right. How how accurate is the narco series? The narco series was not adequate. It's not accurate at all. Um, it's, a lot of it is creative writing, as they as they, as they say. I uh, did not want to participate with them because they did not want to tell the CIA uh, involvement in in the, in the series as being the bad guys. They wanted to portray the CIA as heroes, and I told them that I could not participate in that because I had written a book where I had outlined the truth about the CIA's involvement not only in bringing in tons of cocaine, but their involvement in having a hand in Kiki's murder. So therefore, uh, even though they have a, 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 an act to play my part, um, you know, I, I did not participate in, uh, with them at all. 
uh, with a with a series. So we should take that story as, uh, I mean, because it was a great series, but but it's from your standpoint, Hollywood. It's fiction. Yes, it's 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 it's, it's based on the truth, uh, but it's not the truth. And as as Eric Newman told me himself. Uh, that it was creative writing that uh, they, need, they they were there to entertain, and I told him, but it's not the truth. He said, "Who cares?" He says, "You know, we want you to participate participate with us. We'll take care of you. We'll make you famous." And I said, "I, I don't want to be made famous uh, unless I put out the truth." And my, my my thing is more important than money is to get the truth to the public. Speaking of money, you you have taken lives. Uh, you gave the better part of your life to the U.S. government um, in service of the U.S. government. Were you well paid? No, not really. Um, I never reached uh, the high levels of uh, of, of uh, government or a supervision in government. You know, I was paid okay, but I wasn't wealthy or anything like that. I was the highest ever awarded DE agent in the history of DEA. I think to this date, I'm probably the highest uh, awarded agent. I received the U.S. Attorney General's Award for Heroism at the White House, by the way, issued to me by Ed Meese, Attorney General Ed Meese. And I also received the highest award that any federal agent can receive, which is a Medal of Valor from all the, uh, the, the the federal bar, which is all the directors of all the all the uh, law enforcement agencies in the in the U.S. government, so I have the highest award. But money, I, I I don't have any money. Under which president, and I'm assuming it wasn't Bush Senior, did you receive these awards? Uh, basically, I don't remember who the president was at the time, but it was Ed Meese, was the Attorney General. And I also work with, uh, believe it or not, uh, Bill Barr. I met him. Uh, I went up to the White House and briefed uh, numerous uh, attorney generals uh, to include Janet Reno. So I, I, I met a lot of these uh, big high government officials because I would go to Washington and brief them. Okay. Um, I asked you about the Netflix series. And I, I want to speak about the... Uh, the Amazon series, The Last Narc, which is based on your writings, which is the truth. Um, you appeared in that documentary. How uh, much input did you have in that documentary? How true is that documentary? And there were people who were actually in the room, criminals that were in the room that you later uh brought to the table and had them give their version of what went on in that room. What was their motivation to appear in that series? My motivation was, again, to get the truth to the people so that this kind of situation will never be repeated again, where we have our own government killing our own agents. I mean, that's horrible to even think about it, but that's what happened in this case. Yes, I knew that it was going to be very controversial. And yes, I knew that they were going to come out and state that a lot of it was not true. I knew I was going to have opposition. As a matter of fact, the DEA called Amazon and requested that they don't put this thing out. And I know who the agent that called my name. And I also talked to the people at Amazon that he talked to and said that they should not put this documentary out. If you remember, Sean, it was scheduled to come out a certain month. I kept, I think it was scheduled to come out like in May, and it didn't make it till July. They stopped it. They did not want this coming out. The Camarena murder case to this day is being covered up. To this day, the CIA ain't going to ever admit that they killed or they had their hand in Camarena's murder. They're never going to admit that. So they're always going to say that I'm a liar. But yet, to all those people that asked me, Hector, everybody's saying that this is not true. I said, listen, look at the, the allegations I've made, how serious they are. 
Do you think that if I would have made this up and was accusing these people just just to accuse them or for fame or money, which I I, I don't have made any money off of this stuff, do you think they wouldn't have charged me with subordination of perjury, at, to say the least? I said, and put me in jail? And put not only me, but the witnesses and everybody, the U.S. attorney uh, that testified, uh, uh, that appeared in, in the documentary. Why don't they arrest us all? They can't. Because they know it's the truth. They can verbally say, oh, that's not true. And 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 and, and Hector just trying to, I've even accused him, he's trying to incite a, 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 a riot in the country, a racial riot, trying to, the blacks, to be upset at the CIA. I've been accused of all that, Sean. But you know what? My answer to them is, if I'm not telling the truth, then why don't they charge me? Put me, AUSA, assistant AUSA, Manny Medrano, the witnesses, put us all in jail. Everybody that came out in the documentary knows the truth. But it's easy to say somebody's a liar, but substantiate it. Do something about it. They can't because it's the truth. Uh, you, you know, I asked you about those guys who were in the documentary, um, who were in the room. And, and these guys were criminals yes. um, that, that you were able to bring over. How, how did you convince them to, to show their faces and to appear in this documentary? Like what was in it for them? Basically, they were, remember, they were trying to eliminate him too because they killed a lot of people that were involved because they didn't want this to come out. So they were killing him. A lot of these guys were, remember, they were running. So I found out who they were and I told them, I said, if you come over here, I can save you. You don't have to hide and run in Mexico. And, and I used, uh, I'm a very, I'm a very devout Catholic. And uh, I would ask him on the phone and when I talked to them, I said, listen, you come up here and you cooperate with us. You're not going to be arrested. I know you, you've you been arrested in Mexico and they're trying to get you down there. I promise you that I will not arrest you. And they and they would tell me on the phone, how do we know you're not going to arrest us? We, You know we participated. We were there. And I would say, do you, I would always tell them, do you believe in God? Because most Mexicans are very religious, as I am. And they would say, yeah, I believe in God. If I told you right now, I swear to Jesus Christ, the Lord, that if you come and cooperate, I will not arrest you. But you have to tell me the truth. And then they would say, wow. I said, listen, I'm, I'm a Catholic or you are. I would not put God's name here if I would have been lying to you. That's how I got him to come up. You know, I, I should have asked you this earlier, and you've been very gracious with your time. And I promise you, uh, because the more I, I talk to you, the more I'm fascinated by this story. Uh, are, are the cartels, are they any better now than they were then? Are they worse now than they were then? And, and do you ever see the cartels coming under control and, and, and things going back to, to somewhat normal? Because it feels like they are still running things in Mexico. The cartels now are more powerful than they were before because now the cartels have united and aligned themselves with the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party is arming them. The cartels right now in Mexico are better armed than the Taliban or Al-Qaeda was ever. They have uh, lost rockets, surface-to-ground missiles, uh, M60 machine guns, recoilless rifles, uh, so they're very well armed. They, the Mexican government uh, army could never, you know, uh, win a war against the cartels. They're better armed. The Chinese government has also provided the, 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 the cartels with the precursor drugs they need to make fentanyl. Fentanyl is a very deadly drug, as you know, Sean. I mean, uh, last year, uh, DEA seized 56 million pills of fentanyl, which is enough to kill every American citizen. The cartels are camouflaging uh, fentanyl uh, as uh, gummy candy. There's only one reason they do that, to kill our kids. The cartels are, are controlling the human trafficking on the border. 85,000 children have been imported into this country. Sean, they have disappeared. Homeland Security and, and, and immigration, they don't know where all these children ended up. And I know that 
uh, uh, harvesting uh, organs was a big thing when I was in Mexico. They would, they would, they would, the cartels would get these kids to take out a liver or a kidney or whatever somebody needed over here and sell it. I cringe to think what has happened to 85,000 illegal children that have come into this country that nobody knows where they're at. We have a major problem at this border. The cartels are running that border and they're in bed with a Chinese Communist Party, with the Chinese. If you think that that uh, individuals are arming the cartels, since when can you go to a neighborhood uh, armory and buy and buy a lost rocket <laughs> or surface to air or surface to air missile? That's not true. They are being armed by right now the Chinese. That's how serious it is. You 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 speak about the border. You speak about the Chinese. Uh, Trump ran for president um, on both of those issues. D do you think this guy has a point building that wall? Um, all that he has spoken of about China, it, it, it almost, by listening to you, it sounds like Trump, he knows what's really going on behind the scenes. Trump knows what's going on. And like I said, he wasn't a, a, a favorite candidate of mine because he spoke so so badly of, of Mexicans. Uh, but, you know, he, he had the right idea when he wanted to go into Mexico. If you recall about two or three years ago, the Sinaloa cartel executed 19 Mormons that were, that were going, traveling from Utah into Mexico to attend a wedding. And they, the cartel attacked them and killed them, killed most of them to include babies that were sitting in baby chairs. And they lit those vehicles on fire with a baby sitting in there. And uh, it really infuriated Donald Trump. And he went to Lopez Obrador and he said, uh, we'd like to come in and take care of the cartels for you guys. Enough's enough. We've had enough of these cartel guys. And Lopez Obrador said, no, what, he, what, what Trump I heard told him was, we got to start war. We got to war with these cartels. I'm sick and tired of them. And that the president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador, said, and this was, came out in major newspapers in Mexico, that's what I don't want. I don't want a war in Mexico. What we're going to do is we're going to fight the cartels with abrazos, not balazos, with hogs, not bullets. And let me make sure I understand this. Hugs, H U G S. Yes. Hugs. Abrazos is hugs, and balazos is, bull is, is bullets. We're going to uh, combat the cartels with hugs, not balazos, not bullets. That's what he answered Donald Trump. And he says, No, I don't want you. I don't want you coming in here and attacking our cartels. That would be a violation of our sovereignty, he told the president of uh, the U.S., Trump. Again, I could talk to you all day because this just opens up a whole other line of questioning that I have, but I'll respect your time. Uh, Hector, you you have been an incredibly fascinating guest. Uh, I thank you so much for your service to this country. Um, and I want everybody, please go out and pick up that book. Can you hold it up again for us? The Last Narc. It's available now. Um, this is a must read. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to speaking to you again, Hector. Thank you so much. And I'm available. Uh, if you want to speak to me again uh, on other issues, I'm available. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, my brother.